welcome back everyone to our research talk for this evening and obviously it's it's mid-morning in Florida where Prem is so um, thank you very much Prem for joining us so Prem's from the International University of Florida and um, he's a molecular modeler he also works very closely with experimental teams so he this evening is going to share his expertise um, on um, modeling proteins, DNA, drug interactions, tocoisomerases, our favorite subject. So thank you, Prem, it's all yours. Hey, thank you so much for inviting. Um, I, uh, because this was, an, um, this was a workshop, I, um, I was first putting together these slides on general introduction to MD, but Again, there were so many talks. So I'm gonna repeat some of the stuff that um, has already been presented. Maybe it will be a good refresher. Uh, and then I'll jump to um, the, the project that I'm working on. Um, so let me share the screen. So I hope you can see the slides, the PowerPoint. All right, so um, again, I'll start with um, some intro to molecular dynamics. Um, I wanted to start with uh, some historical perspective um, because, you know, um, biology or biophysics or molecular biology, if you say, um, is relatively new field. Um, you know, by 1940s, we already have quantum mechanics. We had so much... Uh, progress in physics. Uh, we had um, most of the um, most of the physics, you know, <laughs> was done. Uh, but biology, we knew very little. And um, in 1944, um, uh, Schrodinger wrote a book on what is life. And he describes genes, mutations, uh, order and disorder. Uh, but not much was known about uh, molecules at uh, the molecular level, right? Um, and uh, in 1948, uh, Linus Pauling discovered that the alpha helix structure is a polypeptide chain and um, it is helical in nature and so on. And it also provided some idea for the DNA structure. Um, and so in 1953, so I'm very quickly moving to uh, the actual project. So. Uh, in 1953, Watson and Crick uh, with the um, structure that, um, the crystal structure that uh, Rosalind Franklin got, um, they were able to come up with a, uh, with a DNA double helix structure. And, um, you know, and, and they got Nobel Prize in uh, 1962. Um, so in 1958, the first X-ray crystal structure of uh, myoglobin was obtained. Uh, the resolution was not very good, but at least we uh, started to get some glimpse of how these uh, protein molecules look like. Um, and now, you know, if you go to protein data bank, um, you will see much uh, refined uh, uh, structure. Uh, this was very low resolution structure, but it actually paved the way. And this actually got Nobel Prize in 1963. When you think about this, the, the first molecules uh, to have ever uh, crystallized or uh, I mean, biomolecules crystallized and structure determined, uh, it was not long ago. You know, it was maybe 60 years ago or 50, 60, 70 years ago. So, uh, you know, if you think about other fields uh, uh, like physics and chemistry, uh, this was kind of slow. Uh, the reason is that we did not have uh, tools to uh, study these uh, small molecules. So by now, um, if you go to protein data bank, we already have close to 170,000 uh, biological uh, molecular structures. So it includes protein, uh, DNA, and other biomolecules. Uh, but uh, the process of you know, the structure deposition in protein data bank has um, actually uh, increased significantly because now we have many different techniques, cryo-EM, X-ray crystallography, NMR, 
And so because of all these advancements, uh, we see more and more um, structures in the protein data bank. Um, so uh, let's start with the structure of the myoglobin. Um, so we have these structures in the protein data bank, but in order to look at their function, uh, we need to uh, get the dynamics. So uh, the static or average structures cannot fully represent um, the, the function of, uh, of the uh, molecules. Um, so it is almost like looking at a static snapshot versus a movie. So if you just look at this, um, so I grabbed this from Heat, Miami Heat game. <laughs> so if, if you look at this um, uh, static structure, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so protein crystal structures are almost like that. Um, and uh, when we generate dynamics, um, then we could, uh, we could see what's, you know, what, what, how act, um, exactly they function. So, um, and uh, this is why computer simulations um, have been uh, very popular because experiments are limited in space and time resolution and uh, no single experiment or combination can provide the full picture of uh, you know, how these atoms are behaving. Uh, and that's why computer simulations are quite attractive. And um, in order to uh, uh, create these computer models, um, we, you know, it also has a history started with theoretical models um, and reduced models, just HP models, um, hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, kind of uh, properties of these amino acids. And that's how uh, we started. But now lately, um, all atom um, simulations have uh, been quite um, popular. So um, the molecular dynamics is mostly for all atom, uh, but of course you can do a coarse grain, uh, but it is a deterministic method. So you start with a, some initial condition and it will, uh, you know, get, get you to a final condition. Um, unlike Monte Carlo simulations in which uh, you generate these conformations uh, sort of randomly and, and assess their statistical weights um, and, and get uh, the population of these conformations. But in molecular dynamics, you, you're basically generating these conformations as they would evolve um, uh, from these uh, physics uh, uh, principles. So uh, in this method, uh, forces on atoms are computed and combined with current positions and velocity, so intro physics. And um, this was start, uh, this started in um, 70s. Uh, back then, it was very difficult. Uh, the computers were slow um, and, you know, uh, not much was known uh, whether this um, uh, kind of method would work uh, because it would be difficult to get to um, the timescales that, that were more relevant to bio biological timescales. And uh, it was not known, but um, you know, by 2000, 2000 2005, um, it was known that you know, th this method is, uh, uh, is working. And this is how um, you know, uh, these uh, pioneers, uh, the early uh, who started this, uh, um, got Nobel Prize in 2013. So the basic algorithm, you must have seen this uh, before. Uh, we set the initial conditions that can be from protein data bank, and we set the velocity depending on temperature, and we calculate the force um, based on the energy function, and we use the intro physics equations uh, to get the position and velocity at the next time step. So this is um, how we do. We get um, initial condition, initial coordinates from protein data bank or modeling and uh, set the initial velocity. And the force is calculated. Once you calculate the force, you can calculate the acceleration and you can use the, this is very simplified. The actual algorithms are uh, smarter algorithms where you can um, uh, get more accurate uh, with, with less uh, computational um, uh, demand. And so, um, but the, the, the most difficult part is how you get the force um, on atoms, you know. 
And so the force calculation is done uh, through a potential energy function. So you take the gradient of the potential energy function and you get the force, but this potential energy function actually depends, um, is derived from quantum mechanics. So uh, it's from the combination of quantum mechanics, you test, uh, you go back and forth, and this is what uh, we call uh, force field pr parameterization. So once you get the, these parameters, um, then you can use them to calculate the force. The force gives the acceleration and you have the molecular dynamics. Um, so the energy function consists uh, of several terms, um, bond stretching, angle bending, dihedral, uh, van der Waals and electrostatic. And these two, the bottom two are non-bonded interactions because there is no covalent bond. These are bonded interactions. Most of the time that we spend um, on uh, molecular dynamics is in the non-bonded because when you put um, the system, there are way too many, um, uh, too many non-bonded interactions. Um, for example, interaction with the solvent and in interaction with the protein itself. So you must have seen these before. Uh, a typical MD simulation uh, starts with a protein or a biomolecule and you put that in water. So you immerse in water. So this is all atom, um, um, explicit solvent. Uh, sometimes, you know, larger systems, uh, sometimes people also do uh, experiments with without water or with the proper dielectric constant. Um, but, um, uh, you know, a typical system size could be like anywhere from 100,000 to uh, a million atoms. Um, and smaller proteins will be like 200,000, including water, of course. And the simulation is uh, normally done at two femtosecond time step. And there are a lot of um, uh, computational operations uh, on computer, and that's why it's uh, computationally very demanding. Uh, recently, uh, there have been uh, a really good improvement on force field uh, accuracy, and uh, these uh, molecular simulations have been parallelized. Uh, they can run now on GPUs. Uh, and because of that, we have been able to uh, simulate larger and for longer time scales. And, um, you know, you can see that even from uh, the first microsecond to millisecond simulation, it didn't take uh, uh, more than three years. So these are still uh, small proteins. So you can simulate up to milliseconds, but for larger proteins, um, the time scale had, had to be uh, still reduced. So by 2011, um, a lot of uh, simulations already came out. Um, here, the red is the experimental, the blue is uh, computational, which is molecular dynamics. And um, they did uh, um, 12 uh, proteins, uh, simulations of 12 proteins for really long time scales, like 325 or up to like three milliseconds uh, time scales. And uh, many of them actually folded uh, quite fast. So uh, like less than a microsecond, um, 14 microsecond and so on. So if you can simulate for uh, uh, several tenths of uh, uh, microseconds, you can get the folding of the protein. And it is amazing that these computational methods are now able to predict exactly what the structure would be. Um, so some of them actually are from known structure and some of them are not um, even experimentally uh, determined. Uh, so for example, these uh, in it italics right here, um, the red is not actually experimental. It was actually modeled from uh, the other related uh, experimental structures. And the blue is uh, just free simulation uh, without any bias. So just based on these forces, uh, you know, uh, Newton's uh, laws, Newton or the intro, kinematics, uh, they are able to uh, reproduce these uh, structures. And this is just amazing. This is why uh, it was now clear that uh, these uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulations uh, can produce accurate results. Um, again, there are deficiencies. Um, they don't produce all the time, but most of the times we can somehow, you know, make sense of what is happening in the protein uh, whether it is uh, about the folding or about uh, the function. Um, so 
in 2017, um, this paper came out and this was a really, really large system. Um, you can see that it has like 64 million atoms, the total uh, with the water and ions, uh, 64 million atoms. This is the um, HIV uh, capsid, uh, nuclear capsid um, right here. And it was, uh, the, the structure was very difficult to uh, determine, but the combination of experiment and simulation allowed these researchers to, to come up with the structure of the nuclear capsid. Um, so the capsid protein um, uh, was simulated. This, is, uh, this has more than uh, 1,200 uh, proteins. Um, and they did the simulation for, um, this was for 500 nanoseconds. And they were able to look at how the uh, capsid uh, fluctuates. Uh, so these are basically uh, fluctuations in the, uh, in the proteins. Okay. So we are able to simulate by now um, up to this. Okay. So not in our group though. <laughs> this is from um, Sultan group um, back then, um, you know, very famous for NAMD and VMD. Right. And some other examples could be um, ion uh, translocation uh, in the ion channels or drug binding, the free drug binding without, um, without any bias. Uh, you can um, simulate this. This is going to take much longer time than docking, uh, but it is possible to actually get the uh, drug binding just from the uh, molecular dynamic simulation. The others could be conformational changes uh, in function and also uh, how proteins fold. Um, in our lab, uh, we do a lot of uh, different, um, uh, we, uh, different projects and we work with uh, proteins, different types of proteins, different systems. We work with DNA um, and other molecules, okay? Sometimes non-biological like, uh, nanotubes and, and graphene and so on. So these uh, molecular simulations have been useful, uh, not only in looking at the structural changes, but also in function, drug screening, and even in vaccine develop, uh, development. Like uh, you can map the epitopes and how these epitopes bind with the um, um, antibodies and you can, um, you can calculate uh, the binding affinities and so on. Um, so uh, a few examples, I will quickly move on to the uh, topoisomerase. Uh, that's what I'm supposed to uh, speak on. But uh, back in uh, 2011, so it has been uh, almost uh, uh, 10 years, um, we were looking at this uh, fluorescent protein, uh, which is used extensively in um, experiments. And so uh, we wanted to look at the stability of the uh, uh, M-cherry, uh, why M-cherry is not uh, highly photostable. And um, we came up with uh, a theory that, you know, the, the gap here uh, between these beta seven and um, 11, and this gap allows the oxygen molecule to go in. And um, the oxygen molecule, once it goes to the chromophore, then it um, oxidizes and, and uh, you know, uh, makes the uh, pr pr uh, protein non-fluorescent. So we came up with uh, several mutations and we work with experimentalists to do the mutations uh, to seal, basically to seal the, the gap between these uh, beta strands. So we strategically looked at uh, which residues might, you know, make the, the gap smaller. And uh, so we came up with uh, a workable, um, uh, protein um, with higher photostability. But the problem with these fluorescent proteins is that if you make uh, more photostable, then the brightness goes down. So uh, it was, it, it's always a balance between how bright you want and how, um, how photostable you want and so on. Um, I guess nature um, optimizes uh, the fluorescent pro properties of these um, proteins. Um, but anyway, so this, this uh, at least shows that the oxygen um, uh, transport from outside from the solution the, um, to, to inside of the protein and how it gets really close to the uh, chromophore 
uh, we can see it um, from the molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, obviously, we cannot look at the reactions um, easily with the molecular dynamics because molecular dynamics is a classical uh, simulation. Uh, it doesn't use quantum mechanics. Um, so we can't look at the reactions. Um, of course, the force field uh, is designed with the quantum mechanical calculations. But once we get the parameters for these uh, bond stretching, um, angle bending, and so on, uh, these parameters are used classically. And so uh, we can do post-reaction, pre-reaction, not the reaction itself. And then we started working on the transformer proteins, a uh, very special class of proteins that undergo structural transformation from one, for one function uh, to another function. So they have one structure uh, and function uh, some way, and they transform the structure and function some other way. And uh, one example, I was really intrigued with this property. Um, so they, um, the NUSG uh, protein has this kind of structure. So it has the N-terminal domain and C-terminal domain. And uh, NUSG uh, always was in this um, C-terminal uh, beta barrel uh, structure. But uh, closely rela related protein, RFAH, on the other hand, the N-terminal domain was very similar. The C-terminal domain actually uh, was alpha helix. But the researchers um, uh, in 2012, I actually should have uh, put the reference, but um, this was from experiment. We did not do the experiment, uh, but from the experiment, uh, we, um, uh, we started to do the simulation. And this simulation was uh, done without any water and sort of compromised force field uh, because we did not have uh, enough computer time, computational power to simulate in all atom with the um, you know, absolutely best uh, force field. Uh, yet, um, even with uh, deficiency in the force field and not including all the water molecules, we were able to uh, come up with the structure that was really, really close. So here, the red was experimental and the green was uh, from the simulation. And then um, uh, we, we did a couple of, uh, we published a few papers on this. And we also found out that um, Ebola virus proteins, uh, especially the matrix protein does the same thing. It, it has multiple structures, the same sequence, but it folds to different structures. Um, in fact, this one is more like domain rearrangement uh, as opposed to completely refolding to beta, um, but but nonetheless, it is uh, a transformer protein. So we um, so these are the structures that have been found uh, for the matrix protein. So it can exist as a dimer, hexamer, or octamer. Uh, and uh, we started looking at this, uh, and we uh, collaborated with uh, Rob Stalin from Purdue University, and he's uh, an experimentalist, uh, virologist, um, and he works with membranes and, and viruses. And so we decided to simulate them. Um, uh, so we put the plasma membrane with the appropriate uh, membrane composition, and then uh, we let the protein, a dimer, drift towards the membrane and see how it interacts. So uh, the simulation was able to give us details of exactly which residues uh, were involved in um, in, in these interactions. So we also did coarse grain simulation uh, with the full hexamer, and uh, we were able to uh, identify the, the amino acid residues that um, interacted with the, uh, with the membrane. These blue and red um, spheres that you see, uh, that's the head group of the uh, cholesterol uh, molecule. So I didn't realize that the cholesterol could go in and out, um, up and down between these layers. Uh, but it was known before, so something uh, we learned. Um, so we were able to figure out which uh, lipid, which lipid type is clustered by the uh, protein. So we can see that the uh, PIP2 in this case is clustered by the uh, VP40 of the Ebola virus. Um, and we also looked into uh, the mutations, exactly why some mutations are lethal and some are not. And we, uh, we're still studying, so this is still ongoing. Um, so 
we looked at the mutations uh, found uh, in patients uh, from the 2005 outbreak. And uh, my collaborator, um, he actually looks at these uh, viruses coming out from the cell. Uh, so these spikes that you see right here, these are all Ebola viruses coming out of the cell. So they are able to measure, um, you know, the, the production of these virus-like particles. Uh, so this is not exactly a virus, but uh, the VP40, which is the matrix protein, that alone is able to give you these uh, authentic looking uh, virus-like particles. So, and we do these mutations and look at which one enhances the, the production or, uh, or which one increases the size of these proteins. Um, we also looked at, you know, if we can disrupt uh, the uh, interface of the uh, VP40. Um, this was from, for hexamer, but if you have dimer, dimer um, side by side, would have exactly the same interface. And uh, we looked at the graphene. Uh, there were papers that talked about, you know, how um, uh, the, the graphene is able to separate these protein interfaces. And in our case, uh, we, we found that as well. So uh, graphene is a potential uh, disruptor of the Ebola virus. So it could be, you know, the idea was maybe you can have powdered form of graphene and that use that as a sanitizer or something. Um, so, and then recently um, I have started working on the pore formation of uh, the, uh, uh, by the antimicrobial peptides. And I'm collaborating with, um, with a company um, and we look at these uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides. These are called lantibiotics. Um, and uh, they have a special uh, structure right here to bind lipid 2. And we're trying to optimize uh, the properties of, of, the, of these peptides uh, by, doing, uh, by making strategic uh, replacement of amino acids. And so we look at how they how strongly they bind the lipid to, which is needed for the bacteria to uh, build its uh, cell wall. Uh, and also how these peptides can actually insert into the membrane and they can uh, break apart the membrane. So we're looking at just one uh, single chain and it turns out that the simulation showed the uh, mutasin actually can insert into the cell, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, membrane and uh, we simulated that in the transmembrane region and we saw a lot of water molecules going in and out. So this uh, can potentially serve as a uh, water pour. Um, I mean, with just a single, um, single peptide, okay? Um, so this is how the hydrogen bonds are formed by different, um, different groups, uh, mostly uh, the backbone atoms. But we also simulated them uh, with multiple chains. Um, th this, this is already published. This is not submitted. I'm sorry, I was supposed to change it. <laughs> but um, um, you can see that how these peptide chains uh, come close and, and they, they transport even more water molecules and also ions. Um, so I'm just sampling uh, a few examples here and there just to give you um, how broad the application um, of MD is um, in terms of simulating different systems. Um, so uh, graphene and now this one. My uh, colleague um, here at FIU looks at uh, calcification, uh, micro calcification in uh, cardiovascular tissues. And, um, you know, I was interested in if we could uh, simulate that process, how the calcium and phosphate come together and, and form clumps and, and eventually crystallize. And so we uh, did this uh, uh, a couple of years ago and you can see the simulation of calcium and phosphate. You put these ions inside a vesicle. So this is the full vesicle and, and you can see how they um, uh, crystallize pretty much, okay? So, um, so it is possible to look at what, what concentration triggers the, these kind of transitions and so on. Uh, but then now I move on to uh, the um, topoisomerase in which we do um, drug screening to find uh, inhibitors. Okay, let me check how much time I have. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I can't find it, but um, how much time do I have? Okay, all right, 25 minutes. I think I, I have enough um, time. Okay, so drug screening, I think uh, you you pr probably had a session on this, um, what's done in, in drug screening, probably had um, uh, Autodoc, um, a session on Autodoc and stuff, but we do uh, exactly the same. So the idea is to look at the drug library. Uh, there are different uh, types of libraries, the database of drug uh, compounds. And um, so you, you identify the, the database first, and then you identify the target. Once you have the target, you can then use uh, different docking programs that are commercial, that are free. Uh, so we use uh, Vina uh, because it is freely available. Uh, Doc is also freely available, but this one uh, probably is proprietary. Um, but um, once you run through docking, the docking looks at, uh, you know, which compound binds with the protein in that um, active site um, or cavity, um, how strongly it binds, and you select uh, the top ranking compounds, and uh, you do visual inspection, remove duplicates, and, and also go through several filters, because uh, there are um, certain compounds that are non-specific and you don't want uh, non-specific compounds and so on. And ultimately you filter it down to let's say 50 or 100 or uh, depends on how much uh, experiments you can do. Um, and so finally you do in vitro and then we get the hit compounds. Um, that's, the, that, that's actually just the beginning of the story. And once we get the hit, then you have to go through a series of steps to verify that they work um, in vitro, in vivo, um, you know, mouse models, human uh, trials, clinical trials. And uh, the, the entire process actually takes a really long time. Uh, in some cases, it takes up to 15 years uh, to, to go from this step to uh, a product uh, in the market. And uh, so these days, um, it's been used very frequently. This kind of docking um, and in silico screening uh, is getting uh, more and more popular because experimentally, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to find which compounds um, would, would stick with the protein or, or uh, the receptor. And uh, that, that would be like finding a needle in the haystack but with computations, it's uh, really uh, fast. Um, and with the parallelization and faster and faster computers, um, it's, it's getting um, really, really uh, uh, a useful uh, method now. So the system that I'm working on is uh, called the DNA topoisomerase. And DNA topoisomerase um, are enzymes uh, they, which uh, cut the supercoiled DNA and relax them. Basically, during the transcription, at the transcription or replication, uh, when the DNA is read, um, the, uh, the DNA actually becomes supercoiled. And if it becomes supercoiled, it may actually hinder the process of transcription or translation. And uh, so if the supercoils are not disentangled, uh, then the process may uh, halt and, and they, or slow down and affect uh, the function. Um, so the cell may not divide or, or something. And so uh, these uh, supercoiled DNAs um, are constantly relaxed, you know, at the very moment right now in our cells, uh, this is happening uh, uh, right now, you know, so the topoisomerases uh, go to the, the recognize the supercoils, and then they they bind uh, sometimes single strand, sometimes double strand, um, and there are different types of uh, topoisomerases. Um, but topo I is uh, a single strand, so it binds a single strand and cuts it. So that's the process. You have cleavers, so that means that you cut the DNA right there, and then um, and you. Re, re, rewind or unwind and, and then uh, reseal the, the DNA. So um, 
so on unwinding of the supercoiling and this is how uh, the supercoiled uh, DNAs are relaxed. So we wanted to uh, target uh, mycobacterium um, uh, tuberculosis to, to, to topoisomerase uh, because um, this is again needed for the survival of the, the uh, species, um, uh, not the species, survival of the bacteria. Um, actually for, you can say for species also, but uh, the topoisomerase activity, if you can block the activity, then you uh, essentially kill the bacteria. And that's why uh, this can be a potential uh, therapeutic uh, target um, because, you know, you, you, can, you can target in different functions. You know, sometimes you can target the, the membrane, sometimes you can target other proteins and this uh, topoisomerase has not been explored that much. Uh, um, and, and there are no, uh, not too many inhibitors identified. And so we decided to uh, see whether we could identify the inhibitors um, to uh, deactivate the function of the uh, mycobacterium topoisomerase. And there is a crystal structure, um, again, determined by um, my collaborators group, um, Yip Chings. And the, um, the, the active site is uh, represented in this box. Um, that's where the DNA binds. So the idea is that you uh, find a, a molecule, a small molecule that goes to this cavity and prohibits the DNA uh, from binding or from uh, being cut or cleaved. And so, so we wanted to uh, come up with those inhibitors. So, uh, we decided to use a smaller library, this SNX Elite library. Um, the compounds are commercially available, so it was easier for us to, to buy um, if we find any compound that, that, that worked. Um, and so the idea is, was to um, start with 100,000 compounds and select uh, top 1,000 compounds and, and do flexible uh, uh, um, screening uh, based on the molecular dynamics uh, trajectories and, and come up with the top hits. So uh, that's exactly what we did. Uh, so we docked um, 104,000 compounds from uh, Elite Library and we came up with uh, a top hit uh, list of 1,000 compounds. But for these 1,000 compounds, we, um, we, we did um, redocking um, on multiple conformations of the topoisomerase because uh, these side chains right here in the cavity or the active side may actually move. There are ways to do flexible docking, but, um, but, but side chain rotation alone may not really uh, give you the exact nature of the cavity. The, the protein itself um, actually breeds, so that's why um, you know, is flexible. So that's why it's better to generate these conformations um, with molecular dynamics and then do the docking on multiple uh, um, structures. So we generated um, uh, a lot of conformations from 100 nanoseconds of simulation and we used uh, the regular methods. I mean, these uh, can be any other, you can use amber force field or grom gromos and so on. Uh, but um, we docked 1,000 uh, top hits um, that we got before uh, to 1,000 conformations um, randomly sampled. Um, and so basically we have 1,000 times 1,000 uh, docking runs, so about 1 million. So on parallel computers, it's not um, super difficult. So you can, you can easily do 1 million docking uh, in a reasonable amount of time, a few days or maybe uh, even a week, uh, depending on the com computational resources. And so with receptor flexibility, the binding, we found that we could bind these molecules a little bit deeper in the cavity because that, you know, some, some conformation, uh, conformations allowed the, the, the um, compounds to, to bind much deeper. And here, the, this tyrosine right here is the one um, that complexes with the DNA um, 
uh, strand. So the DNA strands goes there and then becomes a covalent complex. And, and that's how the, the DNA strand is cleaved. And so uh, from, the, from the simulation, um, we, we isolated a few uh, compounds. So here are the list of, so actually we, um, so again, my collaborator, Yuk Ching, um, so they uh, purchased these compounds. I only do the computation, so I don't do experiments, um, but um, um, with that experiments, experimental component, um, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, to say anything concretely. So, um, so out of uh, approximately 100 that we, we came up with, uh, we finally ordered uh, 82 compounds um, and, and the uh, uh, inhibition assays were done um, uh, with, with these compounds. And these are the top six where you can see the IC50 is uh, really small for some of these compounds, especially for one, uh, two and three, uh, the IC50 is uh, small. So these are the top six compounds. And from this, at least what we realized is that uh, these compounds have some common uh, 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 properties, like at least uh, the nitrogen here in the ring. Um, so that allowed us to search for uh, more of these compounds, the analogs um, in, in other databases, or um, actually we, we looked into Cambridge uh, database and we found approximately 200 analogs, um, similar structures. Um, and so th th these two are the, the poses um, for the, the top two compounds that I showed before. Um, so we, we had another 200, approximately 200 uh, new um, compounds. And so we did um, another round of screening with uh, 1000 confirmations again uh, and came up with the list of these compounds. So they have, um, especially, you know, compound seven has a really low IC50 value and um, some others have a relatively high, but um, uh, one of these is obviously uh, really good. So we also, um, I mean, the uh, experimentalists, uh, they looked at the um, specificity of, of the compound that it was not supposed to uh, interact or bind with the human topoisomerase, um, but it was it, it was supposed to be very specific to uh, the bacterial topoisomerase. And it seems like, you know, there is, for example, uh, for DNA gyrase, um, it didn't have much effect. Um, so this is the super coil, this is the relaxed uh, state. So, um, and, and so there is not much effect with the, with the compound, but um, with the, um, for, uh, topois uh, mycobacterium topoisomerase, um, you know, uh, you, you see, um, so this is in decreasing order, okay? So decreasing concentration. So I should have actually have a, a triangle right there. So uh, if you decrease the concentration, then the relaxation activity will go up. But for um, high concentration, we, we see um, no relaxation of the supercoil. So that means we inhibit the, uh, the relaxation activity of the myc mycobacterium. Um, so we have continued working on this. Uh, there are different topoisomerases and there are different kinds of binding, different, um, different stages uh, during the function. And so uh, one of the stages is obviously the covalently bound uh, stage in which the um, the DNA is already cut, cleaved, um, and is covalently attached to the protein. And um, so that, that's one stage. So um, we were thinking maybe we could, we could do drug screening on this stage with the DNA being bound in the covalent state um, so that we inhibit the process of um, separation. So it has to, you know, once uh, this is flipped, uh, this has to be joined. With, with the with the with this strand and if we if you can uh, have a drug there then the catalytic activity uh, is inhibited then we could um, um, we could also halt the, or uh, diminish the uh, inhibit the function of topoisomerase so 
uh, for this, we um, we obtained the um, the covalently complex uh, structure. Uh, so we actually uh, so there was no crystal structure of the covalently bonded um, um, DNA and topoisomerase uh, for the mycobacterium um, uh, uh, topoisomerase, um, but we designed that from the E. coli topoisomerase in which the covalently complex um, uh, structure is available. So this is, this down arrow here is the cleave, cleavage site. Um, so for, for bacterial topoisomerase itself, E. e. coli uh, topoisomerase itself, we had um, done some uh, drug screening already. Um, so we uh, looked at the, uh, we took the covalently complex um, structure and then we did the drug screening with a small, very small library, about 2000 compounds. And we were able to uh, come up with uh, one compound that, that showed um, good um, activity, okay? So, um, and so this was done with the, with the DNA still in the cavity um, and that is uh, covalently attached. Um, so in this one, uh, we also um, perform the molecular dynamic simulations uh, to generate um, multiple confirmations. So the covalently um, covalent bond is right here with the, with the proteins. This is the tyrosine. Uh, and uh, we, so um, now, uh, the next uh, question was, um, how, what is the RNA uh, binding activity of these uh, topoisomerases? So uh, these are DNA uh, topoisomerases, but, but some of these are known to bind RNA. And um, top 3 b uh, actually is a known um, uh, RNA binder. So it actually um, binds and, and catalyzes or, or cleaves uh, the RNA. Um, and recently, um, top 3 b uh, human top 3 b uh, is also known to actually um, uh, bind uh, RNA from viruses, different viruses, dengue, uh, chikungunya, um, and, and Zika, and even Ebola, even, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not Ebola, sorry, sorry about that. Um, not, not Ebola, even uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, the RNA from these viruses, okay? Uh, all the positive sense um, RNA viruses. Um, so uh, we, we developed uh, a model. So it's, it's from modeling. Um, so uh, from the E. coli topoisomerase, um, we got from the DNA covalently complex structure and we replaced the DNA with the RNA. So it's much easier to do in computers than, than in experiment, I assume. Um, so um, we, we modeled this. And after we modeled, we uh, looked at the dynamics. So we simulated for 100 nanoseconds. We actually have um, uh, more than 500 nanoseconds uh, simulation now. Uh, and we were able to look at exactly how these RNA uh, uh, nucleotides um, or the the basis um, uh, interact with the protein. So we, we were able to get a better idea of the cavity because there is no structure available. So we had to uh, get it from the simulations. And um, so we, we, now that we have this structure, this could be actually used to uh, do the drug screening on this. We actually have uh, some results I don't have here in the, in the slides, but we do see uh, a lot of drugs actually that can go even beyond, uh, behind the, the RNA strand right here. So um, this work is still in progress and we are working with uh, different groups, uh, including, um, you know, Eves um, at NIH and Yuching, and also with uh, Dr. Mariano's uh, group in um, Texas. Um, so who, uh, found that the uh, top 3B um, is, um, is required for uh, efficient replication of these uh, positive sense uh, RNA viruses. So le let me show you a small movie, how we can look at the, the changes going from the DNA binding structure uh, of the cavity to RNA binding structure. Um, so the, the 
again, tying it back to molecular dynamics, this allows us to at least look at these uh, processes. Um, so uh, again, going back to the, uh, the, the work, uh, recent work by uh, Mariano uh, Garcia's lab, um, and they found that top 3B is required for the viral replication. And so uh, currently we're working on these compounds, um, what kind of compounds are mostly from FDA approved drugs uh, and how they bind with, the, with all sorts of uh, uh, structures like APO structures with other DNA uh, with the covalently bonded um, uh, structure and another structure is non-covalently bonded. So if there is no bond here, we also generate a lot of conformations using the molecular dynamics and um, that gives us better um, filtering of these compounds. So in conclusion, um, molecular dynamics has become an indis indispensable tool to study the biomolecular structure and dynamics uh, at an unprecedented detail, so atomic scale resolution. And also in time resolution, we can look at even picosecond um, dynamics. Um, so, and it has opened up uh, new avenues in drug discovery via modeling and drug screening. And thank you so much. And I will be happy to take uh, questions. Um, just last slide, um, uh, acknowledgement. Um, the work, uh, most of the work uh, was done by a lot of these uh, students. Um, and including uh, some of these former students who worked on the transformer proteins, um, Chola worked on fluorescent proteins, Jiwon did on Ebola virus, um, um, Tim also worked on Ebola virus um, and some other people. And I have um, a lot of collaborators. Um, some of them, I'm sorry, I, I must have missed a few, <laughs> but, um, and some of them are uh, experimentalists, some theorists um, and so on. And finally, the support from uh, funding agencies and thank you.